All right, so um, let's get started. So today, uh, as the remainder of this week, we will reside in the physical layer. So we will continue our journey that we started uh, last Friday, talking about pulse amplitude modulation, uh, spectral efficiency, match filter, receivers, signal constellations, and so forth. But before we get started, a few announcements. So the project descriptions has now been released on Ping Pong, so you can just download it and uh, uh, flip through it. And it's good that you flip through it uh, before the kickoff meeting. So if you have any questions, you can post them already at that point. Um, so the project groups have been um, um, why is this not working? Okay, so the project groups have been uh, um, assigned. So if you haven't received the project group, then something is wrong. So then you need to act uh, immediately on this. And then uh, don't forget to sign up for the kickoff meeting uh, as soon. Uh, if you haven't already done it, do it right away. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can, okay, so. Uh, um, let me, I have some technical problems here. Just a second, S see if I can somehow. Uh, why is this not working? Mm. Okay, I'm back. All right, so uh, a short review of what we did last time. So this is uh, <coughs> basically what we're talking about. We're talking about moving bits over a channel. And the first thing we need to do then is to uh, take the bits and produce a transmitted signal. So we have some bits and we want to produce a, a, a transmitted signal. And the uh, way we want to do that, in this course at least, is to use pulse amplitude modulator consisting of a mapper and this device here uh, called pulse amplitude modulator. Uh, has a basic pulse shape G and takes some symbols in and then produces a output signal, which is a train of pulses, where we have the basic pulse G and multiply with the amplitude AK and AK is produced by the bits. So by doing this, we encode the bits in AK and then just send that over the channel. We'll talk more about this uh, in a short while. Common receiver for this pulse amplitude modulation looks something like this. So here we have the transmitted still. This is the transmitted signal. The received signal consists of the transmitted signal plus some noise. That's the simplest channel model we can think of. And then we uh, do the following things at the receiver. Uh, we feed that through a filter with a certain impulse response F and we get an output signal Y. So this is an analog signal here, which we then sample. And we sample that once every T seconds, where T is a time between consecutive pulses. So ideally, we would like to have this, right? That the output samples YK is equal to AK. That's what we would like to achieve. Um, now, this would not be possible if the noise is non-zero. So there will be some noise component uh, in this. Uh, but at least in the noiseless case, we would like to uh, be able to guarantee this. So uh, if we ignore the noise then, then, and just look at what YK is, well, it's the um, sample of the analog signal Y at time K times capital T, and then by just plugging this into uh, what it is, we see that it consists essentially of two terms. The term that uh, we are looking for, so we're looking for y, a, a uh, subscript k, that's what we're looking for. And then there is some scaling constant in front of that, which is uh, amplitude of the, uh, uh, this pulse h at uh, time zero. And then there is some other stuff here, which is called the intersymbol interference. So this uh, mysterious uh, signal H is the convolution of 
the basic pulse that we use and the impulse response of the receiver. So it's a convolution between G and F that gives us H. Okay. So ideally what we would like to do is to get rid of this term, the intersymbol interference term, and we could do that by simply saying, okay, here we see that we have a bunch of samples of H, let's uh, design G and F such that all of these samples are zero. Okay, and if we do that, we get a pulse H, which again is the convolution between G and F. So we design G and F to get H, and then properties of H we would like to control. And if H is such that all samples uh, spaced by t seconds, except the one when t is equal to zero, is zero, and for t equals zero, it's one. Then we uh, uh, get the desired um, relationship that y is equal to a. Okay, so this is the time domain uh, condition, and one can show that the corresponding uh, requirement in frequency domain looks like this. So capital H here is the Fourier transform of small h. Okay, so uh, actually this, uh, this expression here is quite handy when we would like to uh, derive properties of these type of pulses. Uh, so any pulse G uh, which has support that is a duration that's less or equal to t. Remember that t is the time between consecutive pulses. Okay, so the duration of g we can choose to be anything we like. It could be smaller or equal or larger than t. Uh, all of these possibilities are, are, are available to us. But if it's less than t, okay, so the pulses are shorter than the time it takes between two pulses, then we will get ISI free transmission if we choose f to also have a duration which is less than t. Okay? So we choose g to be time limited to maximum t seconds. We choose f to be time limited by maximum t seconds. If that is the case, we have no intersymbol interference. So that's a pretty easy design rule. Okay? The problem with this is that then the bandwidth of g will be infinite. Okay? Because it's time limited and therefore it's not band limited. We typically want band-limited signals, if we could have them. So uh, the other case is that when we oppose that G must have a bandwidth of maximum W, then we can derive from the frequency domain uh, expression here certain properties. And this is an important thing, so that's why it's in red here, right? So it says if the symbol rate is greater than 2w, then we have intersymbol interference. But there is nothing we can do about that. So we cannot force this term to become zero. If we're actually exactly at uh, the symbol rate is exactly twice the bandwidth, then it's possible to do that. But only when g convolved with f is a sink. When uh, symbol rate is less than 2w, then we can do intersymbol interference free transmission for many choices of G convolved with F. Okay, so here we have some design freedom. Uh, and one way to choose uh, uh, this latter, when we in the latter uh, condition here, which is the, I guess the more practical one, then we can choose to uh, select uh, H, which is the convolution of G and F, to be a raised cosine, spec uh, a pulse with a raised cosine spectrum and if the spectrum is capital HRC, then the spectrum looks something like this. And I'm not going to go into the details here. You can go back to Friday and see what we talked about then. But then we see that we have, at the end of the day, we have a bandwidth here, which is uh, uh, 1 plus alpha over 2t. Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah. So let's, let's uh, pick up from here. Um, and then uh, we know that H here is the convolution of G and F. So if we want to uh, have a, an overall H, which uh, is a pulse with the raised cosine spectrum, how should we choose G and F here? So um, does it, do we have any suggestions? What should we do then? I mean, we know what the, what the convolution should be, and we know what the spectrum should look, be like. So how can we select uh, the time domain signals here or the spectrum, uh, spectrum here of these two? That's our design choice. We need to select a G, we need to select an F such that the convolution is something. Okay. 
So uh, very often we would like to do the following. Sorry. We want to want to select F, and remember F is the, the impulse response of the receiver filter. We would like to select that to be equal to G conjugate and then time reversed. Okay, so G is the pulse we use at the transmitter. Let's take the complex conjugate of that and let's time reverse it. Okay, and we will see why, why this is a good choice a little bit later this lecture. But let's assume that, okay, so this is the fact. We would like to do this. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the Fourier transform of F, so capital F or small f here is a little bit of a stupid notation, but that's, that's how it is. Um, um, let's, let's write it like this. So capital F or small f, which is the Fourier transform of small f, is then uh, the Fourier transform of G conjugate negative T, which is simply G conjugate F. Okay. The last equality comes from, from, uh, from a property of Fourier transform. So basically, if you conjugate the time signal, you conjugate the, the frequency signal. If you time reverse the time signal, um, No, it's the opposite. Uh, actually, both the conjugate and the time reversal needs to produce this conjugation. Okay. I, will, I, won't, I won't spend time on that. Okay, and then, uh, so what is the overall frequency response then? Well, it's G times F. So capital G times capital F. Is that becomes then G of F times G conjugate of F. All right. And this is simply G of F magnitude squared like this. OK. So we're now in a situation wha where we know what H, what we would like to have H to be, namely this. OK, whatever it is. So it's a known function to us we would like to design G. So we still have some freedom to choose uh, G here in order to uh, fulfill this equation here. But one very simple choice to do is simply to say is simply to say that G of F is the square root of this raised cosine spectrum. Okay. Why is this allowed? Well, I mean, first of all, we see here that uh, real valued spectrum, so there's uh, not com no complex stuff here. It's always positive, so there's no problem with negatives and things like this. So this is well defined. Okay, and once we have this, we know the spectrum of G, we can simply time, uh, do the inverse Fourier transform of this, we, we get the pulse G of T in time. And once we have G, uh, we know what F is. Okay, so and then we're done. Okay. Okay, so. Um, these, these pulses, So this is called a square root raised cosine spectrum. Okay. So this is the square root raised cosine spectrum rather than the raised cosine spectrum. And why is that? Because it's the square root of a raised cosine spectrum. Okay. So it's quite uh, logical, I would say. So uh, once we have this, 
we know that we one selection of G could be just to um, the Fourier transform of G. We can select that as being the square root of the race cosine spectrum. And then uh, some nice person has uh, done the inverse Fourier transform of that for us. And here's the time domain expression here. Okay. It's more there for completeness than anything else. It's just that, okay, if we select to do it this way, we know exactly what the pulse should be. It has a closed form uh, solution, so no problem, really. Okay. Now, from, from the definition here, it's pretty clear that if we take uh, G uh, R R C and multiply it with itself, then we get the race cosine spectrum. And that if we convolve, and therefore, if we take the inverse Fourier transform of, of the left-hand side here, we get the convolution of the two time pulses. And that should be then the inverse Fourier transform of the right-hand side, which is just the race cosine pulse in the time domain. Okay. Questions on that so far? Okay. So just to make clear, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to design G and F such that we have no inter-symbol interference. Okay. So if we select G to be a root raised cosine pulse and F to be a root raised cosine pulse, then we're in business. Okay. So that's one particular choice we can do. Okay, uh, so that's good. Um, so if we have done this, can we say something about how good is this solution? Well, in, in one way it's a perfect solution uh, that we get rid of the intersymbol interference. So by doing this we get rid of the intersymbol interference, but the, the, uh, the price we have to pay has to do with bandwidth. We know that we're operating in this domain where the symbol rate is a little bit less than twice the bandwidth. Okay. And the bandwidth of the uh, raised cosine pulse is this, and therefore this is also the bandwidth of the root raised cosine pulse. Why is that? Because then the, the spectrum of the root raised cosine pulse is just the square root of this, and it doesn't change the bandwidth of it. It just cha changes the shape. So this is the bandwidth, and this is for both raised cosine pulses and root raised cosine pulses. Okay. Taking, um, uh, the, taking the square root of this changes the numbers here, but it doesn't change this number, okay. the duration of the, or the bandwidth of the pulse. Okay, so... Um, this leads us then to saying something about spectral efficiency. The definition of spectral efficiency is the following. Uh, let's call it nu. Okay, so this is the spectral efficiency. And it's the ratio between the bit rate, the data rate that we can support, and the bandwidth of the transmitted signal. Okay. So this is the data rate. And this is the bandwidth of Tx for transmitted signal. Okay. And the unit of this is bit per second, because that's Rb, and then divided by the unit of the bandwidth, which is hertz. So it's bits per second per hertz. Okay, we would like this to be large, right? We would like to have a large data rate, Rb, per bandwidth, uh, unit bandwidth, right? Because bandwidth is something that we would like to conserve. Okay, so suppose then um, the bandwidth we use is this one plus alpha over two T. One plus alpha over two T. Okay. 
uh, then um, um, this can be um, yeah. Uh, what is then the data rate? Okay, so data rate. We need to go back a few slides here to figure out what the data rate is. Okay, so we're, we're looking for this thing, the data rate. So what is it? Well, first of all, we have T here. It's the same T as here. Um, it's the time between consecutive pulses. So we know what the symbol rate is. That's the number of symbols we transmit per second. And that is one over T, because we transmit one pulse one symbol every t seconds. The data rate depends on how many bits we transmit per symbol and the symbol rate. Okay, so we transmit uh, log 2m bits per symbol. And why is that? Well, it's because if we have, um, um, uh, we take k bits to produce one symbol. That's done in the mapper. And what is k? Well, k is the number of bits in per symbol. So m um, is equal to 2 to the power of k. So another way to write the, the bit rate here is k over t. Okay. So log 2m or k is the same thing. Okay. So now we know what the data rate is. Okay, so it's log 2m divided by t. And now we can compute the spectral efficiency nu as then rb, which is log 2 of m divided by t, uh, divided by bandwidth, which is then 1 plus alpha divided by 2t like this. So just combining these two equations, the t's will cancel and we arrive at 2 times log 2 of m 1 plus alpha. Okay. So if we want to have high spectral efficiency, what can we do? What should we select alpha to be? Should be high or should be small? I could ask my daughter about this also. Maybe she will get it. She's 14, right? So if you want to have the ratio large and alpha is in the denominator, would you like it to be large or small? You want it to be small, okay? What is the design choices we can have from alpha? It's from zero to one. So we want this to be as close to zero as possible, right? What about M? Should that be large or small to have large spectral efficiency? Okay, it should be large, right? Okay, so what is stopping us to select a very, very large M here? We don't know this yet, but we will figure this one out maybe today or next time. Okay? But there is a fundamental limit to how large we can choose M to be here. Okay? And it has to do with basically uh, the transmission power of our transmitter. How much power we allocate to the transmitter signal in relationship to the noise level that we have on the channel. So signal to noise ratio essentially. Okay, uh, 
Why do we want to select alpha a little bit larger than zero? It's not clear, but let me just state this, and we won't go into the details in this course, but if we select alpha to be too small, that turns out to be a complicated to get that to work in practice due to practical constraints. Okay? So it's for practical purposes when we have to want to have be cost effective, we select alpha to be a little bit larger than zero because that will limit the requirements on the rest of the transmitter circuitry and receiver circuitry. Okay? So I'll just leave that as a little bit of a mysterious uh, statement at the moment. And if you like, I'd be happy to take this offline and I can explain exactly what's going on. Otherwise, you have to take another course, I guess. Okay? So in practice, alpha is a little bit higher than zero. Maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.25 or something like this, depending on how, val how valuable you think bandwidth is. Okay. So any questions before we continue? Okay, so I hope this was relatively clear. Okay. Um, what we want to do is to design G and F in the best possible way. If we select um, uh, uh, G to be a root raised cosine pulse and F also to be a root raised cosine pulse, then this is the resulting spectral efficiency we have. We can play around a little bit with alpha and you see alpha is, is part of the signal uh, definition here. So we can play with alpha to, uh, al okay, maybe I should write this also that alpha is a number between 0 and 1. Okay. Uh, we would like to tend to the smaller part of this if we want to be spectrally efficient. Okay. Uh, typically, we don't want alpha equals 0 because that is problematic for implementation. Okay. But once we've done this, we've selected our alpha, and then this is the resulting uh, spectral efficiency. Okay. So what we want to do now is to uh, go further and look a little bit about the receivers and then talk a little bit on why we would like to do this. Why does this happen to be a good choice? To motivate that a little bit and see what the consequences of that choice is. Uh, before we continue, there are a couple of review slides here. I just want to refresh your minds and, and, and if this is brand new knowledge to you, don't be too worried about it because these are basically some simple definitions that you could just learn. Okay? Um, it's, it's not so much to it really. So first of all, the energy of a signal, what is that? Well. First of all, we allow this for mathematical reasons, we allow these uh, signals to be complex valued. And the same equation applies for the real valued signals, it's just that there is no need to do conjugates and there is no need to take magnitudes and, and, and so forth when we're dealing with real valued signals. Otherwise it's exactly the same equation. So uh, the energy of a signal, E, is defined as x magnitude squared and then we integrate that over all times. Okay, so that's the energy. And the energy somehow tells us uh, about the size of the signal. A signal with a large energy is a signal with large size. Okay. A signal with zero energy is the all zero signal. So it's you know a very small signal. Okay. The inner product between two complex signals is defined as follows. First of all, it's uh, these brackets, or, or you know, I don't know what to call them in uh, here, but the angular uh, parentheses, and then x, y, and the order of x and y is actually important. Uh, and it's defined as follows. It's x times y conjugate, and then we integrate for all times. Okay, so that's the inner product. Um, 
If you like, you can view this as a scalar product between two vectors. It's the same essential concept, except now uh, we are dealing with uh, signals here rather than the maybe the more familiar uh, vectors in three-dimensional space or, or something like that. Okay, um, now of course if x and y are real valued, then the order of them doesn't matter. But if they're complex valued, the order matters. The norm or the length of a signal is defined uh, with x and then double vertical lines like this. So what is that? It's the square root of the inner product of x with itself. Okay, which is the square root of x magnitude squared integrated for all times which is just the square root of the energy. Okay. So what I said earlier here is that x here is somehow uh, related to the size of the signal. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, uh, um, explained in this expression, right? That the length of a signal is the square root of the energy. Now, the energy is something which is always positive, so there is no problem in taking the square root of this. Um, but then it becomes a number which has uh, the right dimension, if you like. Okay. So either one talks about the energy or the norm of the signal and say that this is large, then we mean uh, like a big, big signal somehow, a, a sizable signal. Right. doesn't really matter if we square it or not. Okay, now if we have the concept of length, then we can measure distance. Okay. So the distance between two signals, x and y, is the length of the difference between x and y. And, and this is not so difficult. I mean, if we have two points in space, and we have the origin here, and maybe we have a vector x here, and a vector y here, what is the distance between x and y? Well, let's just take uh, x minus y, which is this vector, x minus y, and then measure its length. And that's the, the distance between x and y. Okay, so that's exactly what we do here. So here we measure closeness between two signals. So when x is equal to y, the distance between uh, these two signals is what? If x is equal to y, what is the distance between x and y? Zero. zero, right. We integrate the zero signal and become zero. When x is not equal to y, we get a positive number that tells us how far they are apart. Okay. We talked about this also earlier, so let's just refresh our minds. Uh, minimum distance receiver. So when the receiver uh, um, is given the observed received, uh, the receiver observes the received signal. That's what it does, right? So based on R, it needs to figure out what data was transmitted. And if we have M possible signal alternatives, one up to capital M, the first thing we can do is to decide which one of these signals is probably the one that was transmitted. Once we know that, we can figure out what is the bit pattern corresponding to that signal. So uh, the minimum distance receiver does uh, basically two simple calculations. It first computes the distances between the received signal and all possible signal alternatives. And it does this for L equals 1, 2, blah, 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 up to capital M. Okay. So once we have a set of distances to the corresponding signal alternatives, we choose the signal alternative which is closest to the received signal. And we think that is the signal that the transmitter sent. A uh, little bit more precise, what we do is we, we select the signal alternative index with the smallest distance. So if we plot all the distances here, which signal alternative do we choose? from? Choose? Well, we choose the one whose um, um, uh, that corresponds to the smallest distance. So if uh, the minimum over L of DL is 
equal to dm hat. Okay, but it's uh, it's actually m hat that we're interested in. We're not interested in the distance per se. We're interested in knowing which signal is closest to the received signal. So we're after m hat. And once we have m hat, we can figure out what bits were transmitted. Okay. Any questions? You're a little bit hard to decode today, so I'm not sure if you're bored or if you're just confused. Right? It's good if you give me a little bit of an indication of wi which one there is, because I have two strategies out of that, uh, that way, right? And they're quite opposite, right? Either to speed up or to slow down, right? So, okay. All right, so let's continue then. I'll just assume that you're bored and then we will pick up the pace a little bit, okay? All right, so now, uh, we have been uh, developing this with the uh, transmitters and receiver, and then we had a transmitter pulse, which was G, and we had the receiver uh, uh, impulse response, which is F, right? And we have selected to use the same notation I as in this book, which is one of the recommended readings. Now, in the middle of the book, the author has chosen to, uh, to, to change notation. Okay. If I'd been the author, I would not have done this. But, you know, the author of the book did this. So let's follow the author here so you can sort of understand when we talk about things here, you have roughly the same notation as in the book. Okay. So a little bit of a notation alert here. So to be consistent with the book, in particular this, uh, oh, sorry, this, uh, this chapter, we, we change the notation a little bit. And what we do here is that instead of having G here, it's now H. Okay. Yeah, I know, it's stupid, but that's how it is, okay? Uh, and we keep on uh, using uh, F as the uh, impulse response here. So the transmit pulse is now, the transmit pulse is now called H and should not be uh, confused with G as we had before. Okay, so then to repeat, what we want to do then is to make the convolution between the transmit pulse and the receiver filter to be have this nice property so we avoid the inter interference uh, uh, problem. Therefore it should be a Nyquist pulse. Uh, we're not, uh, it, for a Nyquist pulse to be uh, 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 Okay, so, so, and this is the criterion. We take H and call it with F. We sample that at uh, uh, regular spaced um, times, uh, spaced by T seconds, and then we get a number when K is equal to zero, and we get zero for all other Ks. Um, a Nyquist pulse actually says that C here should be equal to one. Okay, that's what we call a Nyquist pulse before. Now, that is not strictly required. Okay, so if we choose C to be uh, not, uh, oops, sorry, if we simply say that C should be uh, greater than zero, say, that, that's uh, typical. If we say that C should not be equal to zero, that simply says that um, Y OK here would be equal to C times A K. Okay. So th 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 this, this, uh, this C here only is a scaling factor. But it doesn't matter as long as we know what it is. We can just simply divide y with c, and then we're back to business again, where y is equal to ak, where ak is the, the thing that we would like to decode. OK. So um, let's uh, have this as the criterion that we would like to fulfill. Okay. Now, a filter which is matched to the transmit pulse has this property. Okay, so remember now that H here is the transmit pulse. H is the transmit pulse. We would like to select F. And if we select F to be exactly this, then we say that F is matched to the transmit pulse. A matched filter can be used to compute inner products. Okay. And we will soon see why, why this is good. So if the input is R, 
And here we have a filter whose impulse response is matched to H of T. Okay. Then the output Y, if we sample that at time zero, is the inner product of the input with uh, the pulse to which the filter is matched. Okay. And we'll see in a second why this is true. Okay. Pictorially, what's going on here is that if we have a pulse H, that maybe looks something like this, what is then uh, H, the, the impulse response which is matched to this? Well, it's F of T being H conjugate. Okay, so the first thing we should do is to take the complex conjugate of this. Now, it happens to be a real valued pulse in this case, so it doesn't matter. And then we should time reverse it like this. So that will be a pulse that looks something like this. Okay, so you take the pulse and you flip it. And that's your matched filter impulse response. Okay. One problem by doing this is that if we have here a, a, uh, a pulse which is uh, causal in the sense that it's zero for all negative t's, then uh, the impulse response becomes a non-causal uh, impulse response. And that means that this device here is non-physical in the sense that it looks into the, it produces an output uh, uh, for future inputs. Okay, so it has to somehow, the device has to look into the future. Such devices are um, non-physical. Okay, so the only thing that can look into the future is, is uh, uh, somebody who tells you fortune, right? And typically these are hoaxes, so you can pay for that for, for entertainment, but it's not a physical process, right? So. If we're interested in making this as a physical device, an implementable device in, 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 in uh, um, um, real time, then uh, what we need to do then is to uh, uh, shift this impulse response. Let me continue to draw this. We would like to uh, shift this to the right, such that it becomes a, a causal filter. And one way to do that is to simply shift it a little bit to the right here. Okay. And then we have a causal filter. So this is F of T minus some T0, where uh, the non-causal filter started at negative T0. Okay. So this is then a causal implementation of this uh, filtering here. And that's sometimes useful. So for instance, in your projects, you might want to take this into account. Okay. Now people got, uh, I got their attention here. I know the tricks. Right. It's on the exam, it's on the project. Right? So. Okay. Um, Let's, let's take uh, 15 minutes now. <laughs>